Hello, everyone, and welcome to my temporary living room and to this panel, Corruption in Europe, the Abuse of EU Funds and Dangers for the Rule of Law. Uh, we have an excellent panel today, uh, composed of Daniel Freund, a Green MEP from Germany, Lukas Wankenecht, a Czech senator, and the first European public prosecutor, Laura Kodruzakovici, who will be joining us momentarily as soon as she sorts out her Zoom connection. Um, we will start with Mr. Freund, who um, has been a member of European Parliament since last year um, from the Green Party, sitting on the Budgetary Control Committee and the Committee on Constitutional mm -hmm. Affairs, as well as co-chairing the Intergroup on Anti-Corruption Affairs. Uh, Mr. Friend previously worked in the Brussels Office of Transparency International, where he was responsible for combating corruption among EU institutions uh, as head of advocacy for EU integrity. And he's also recently returned from some investigative exploratory trips to Hungary and the Czech Republic. And I wanna hear more about your trip and what you uncovered there. Oh, and I forgot to introduce myself, of course. I, I, I'm always doing this because I'm very excited to get to the panel. Um, I'm Valerie Hopkins. I'm the Southeast Europe correspondent for the Financial Times. So, Mr. Friend, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks uh, for, for being here and for, for moderating this session uh, for, for us. Uh, we are still waiting for Ms. Kivisi, which who seems to have some technical issues, but uh, should, be, should be here momentarily. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's good to have you here for, for this important debate. Um, I, I think tonight we'll, we'll hear quite a bit about two EU member states. Uh, I think uh, Czechia and, and Hungary will probably come up quite a bit. And, and I had the chance to visit both countries uh, in, in the last few months. Um, I actually just came back uh, on Friday from, from a couple of days in, in Budapest. And I have to say that I'm still shocked, almost shell-shocked uh, about what I saw and, and heard on the ground. Everything. The, the information is public uh, about the situation in Hungary, of course, but um, well, thanks to the great works of, of journalists that are on the ground, such as Valerie, but, but many other journalists that, that are working on, on the ground. But to see it with your own eyes and to hear it from those that, that are immediately affected on the ground is, is a completely different story. And um, so, so that was quite quite an experience for myself. Um, in Czechia, we have a prime minister uh, who became incredibly rich uh, in a few years, not through hard work, I would say, but basically through EU ag agricultural funds or EU funds in general. And he is right now, and we have another round of negotiations uh, next week, he is negotiating these very funds at EU level, including uh, millions of funds that might end up in his own pocket. And this obviously poses a conflict of interest uh, that has to be resolved. Um, in the case of Hungary, it's maybe even more breathtaking. Um, to me, it seems that Viktor Orban has used the time since he came into power in 2010 to turn his country, I mean, some say it's a mafia state, maybe the more uh, the, the better analogy is, is a Middle Eastern style emirate, uh, and, and he is the sheikh of, of that country. And the only difference between him and the rulers in the Gulf is that they derive their money from, from oil, and Orban is doing that with the money that is coming from European taxpayers, the funding by the EU. It might sound weird at first, but if you look at it, the, the EU funds function a little bit like oil. Uh, they come from the outside, uh, the, the flow barely dries out, and um, the, at the first instance it's only accessible by, by a small elite. Uh, Orban distributes this money in, in the country, and uh, maybe the most important issue that there is little to no accountability of what is actually done uh, with this money. Uh, I have discovered more and more over the last few months uh, how how short the, the, the control from the EU goes uh, and how the system basically collapses when the control mechanisms in the country itself no longer function or are captured uh, by, by the ruling elite. So in a way that money in Hungary is, is used um, for two things, a bit like at the Gulf for self-enrichment and ensuring uh, political in allegiance and stabilizing the system. So I think that the situation in Hungary and in the Czech Republic um, is not happening despite these countries receiving EU funding, but in a way, because of it, um, we have to face 
that inconvenient truth that the way that the EU is currently spending its money is, is creating the very structures that we should be fighting. Um, I can maybe illustrate that uh, with one of the metaphors that I heard from a journalist last Thursday in Budapest. He, he said that the opposition in Hungary uh, that still exists, but it is playing on an uphill football, uh, it's, it's playing an uphill football match against Fidesz. So there's rigged courts, there's a rigged political party system, rigged constituencies, uh, and, and, and Orban fully controls the media. And the EU is the team sponsor of, of Fidesz and is funding to make the hill of the, of the pitch even steeper. So what I'm trying to say is we, we can't resolve this issue by just pointing the finger at Babish or at Orban. We, we have to start with ourselves. We have to look into um, how we disperse EU funding and how we control what's, um, what's done with the money. So I, I wanna close with two suggestions to, to start up the debate later. Um, first, I think the EU should dedicate more resources and more efforts to help those that do fight this corruption or that do uncover it, be it investigative journalists, NGOs, they need our protection and they need funding also from the EU uh, to, to bring this, this fact to a wider audience. And second, I'd say um, that Hungary actually should not get any additional funding, such as the money now uh, about to start flowing from the recovery fund if we cannot check on how this money is spent. So I would say no recovery fund without um, control, for example, by the European P public prosecutor. Um, I, I heard that uh, 700,000 Hungarians have signed a petition calling for Hungary to join uh, the public prosecutor. That's more than 10% of the voting population. I think we have to take these voices very seriously uh, and make sure that Ms. Kovizi, who's hopefully joining us shortly, uh, has the resources to do her work, including in, in Hungary. Valerie, you have it. I've muted myself. <laughs> How many Zoom panels? I'm always telling people to unmute themselves. Um, I want to come back and ask you a bit, since I'm a journalist and I like detail, about a bit, a bit more details about the trip and some of the specific sites you saw. But I, I will give the floor to Mr. Vakanek to ask about your experience uncovering what was the largest EU funds fraud mechanism so far in the Czech Republic. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation at the beginning. Hi to all. So I will very briefly describe our reality here in Prague because how to say it is not very easy to live here in Prague. Yeah. We have two very big issues if we will talk about the EU money spending and about the democracy. The first is a state capture. Because as you know, our Czech Prime Minister is at the same time, he controls too many companies which are beneficiaries from EU funds in an amount of billion Czech crowns. It means he is sitting on the two chairs at the same time. And it is not only about the conflict of interest. If you abuse conflict of interest, it is corruption. It is the higher level of that. So, and I, if, if possible, I will go very briefly within the agenda because we have some points which should be discussed. And I will try to find some short answers to these questions. So first is about uh, how have politicians used EU funds to undermine democracy and the rule of the law. I think there are two possible ways. And also we have experience here in Prague with Babish. The first one is a using of anonymous ownerships of companies. Babish has some former project from EU funds, just some of it. And he hides his companies in untransparent structure, uh, we call it Stockness Farm case. And the problem is also here in Prague with the rule of the law because this case uh, is investigated by the police for last five years. And we still not have any final conclusion on that. There's a problem. So it means the first is state capture problem uh, because if Babish has so high political pressure on the whole system political. It means uh, on all of the national authorities. He has power of, on Ministry of Justice. Ministry of Justice has the power of state prosecutor's office, offices. It means that my feeling is that these uh, criminal law enforcement bodies 
they they are they fear to prosecute him yeah because that is the case if you have prime minister which is up to you how can you make some clear transparent investigation this is the first problem of us and i think we should how to say to help with this within other authorities like european prosecutor of office so i think we will discuss later then the second question was about the uh, loopholes in eu legislation uh, i think that european legislation is okay uh, after fifth ml directive i think there are no loopholes but the pro problem is that european commission they should help to uh, member states to deal with this i'm not sure if they have some good tool because as you know maybe the system arachne i'm not sure if it's sufficient i think it should be improved somehow because if the uh, member states will have some support from european commission they should deal with that for now i'm not sure about support so i think that this is, should be the problem of european commission for now yeah to find some way how to deal this issue how to find the final beneficial owner of the companies which are abusing your eu money the first question was about uh, the eu dispose of appreciate appreciate tools to the end of uh, misuse or does it simply lack of the political will to sanction i will speak about the framework i think that european union has the law which give gives enough power to commission and council but i feel that these two body they are scared to use them it means if babish we have a huge conflict of interest here in prague but also on the level of european council there's also a huge conflict of interest if babish is dealing with the new multi annual financial framework as the one of the biggest uh, beneficiary from this money here in prague how, how is this possible and how is it possible that commissioners uh, deal with him how is it possible that they, they, they should tell him please you have conflict of, conflict of interest you can go here on council and you should, you should stay in prague because also it is a problem of them of mrs von Leyen and others because they also ignore the financial regulation which prohibits to deal with conflict of interest of such a people yeah they, how to say they they have active conflict of interest all of the commissioners if they are discussing with babish and that's the case if commission has some rules and they don't follow them how we, they would like to follow the rules on the national side it's very difficult for us so the fourth and the last uh, question it was would the suspension of eu funds work or is there a risk uh, that it backfires i think that suspensions will works only in one case if it will be directly focus on babish or orban and or other prime ministers which are abusing the money it means it is it has, it has no sense to make the overall suspension but it should be focused on that it means i have some small recommendation for european parliament because for now you will deal with uh, multi annual financial framework i think it's very easy way how to finally uh, deal with this, this this issue i think there should be very short amendment or the one paragraph in the new framework which will uh, strictly prohibit uh, spending of eu subsidies to such a people like babish it means if you are the prime minister if you earn such a huge amount of the money so your companies will be excluded it should be concretely described and it is possible and if we will do this because as you know on national side it is very big problem to do that so that's enough for me for the beginning and we have other colleague here as i can see thank you so much mr vengenek and i i in my haste as usual to get to the meat of the discussion i did not properly introduce you as well with your bio so just for those who, who are on the call and may not know, uh, I'm sure that there are a few. Um, Mr. Vanganek is a Czech economist, auditor, and politician who's serving as a senator um, in the Czech Republic from the Czech Pirate Party. And he also co-founded an auditing, auditing organization and think tank called Good Governance. Uh, from February 2014 until June 2015, Mr. Vanganek served as the first deputy minister of finance in the Czech Republic, focused on financial management and audit. And in 2015, he received a prize for courage for whistleblowing 
Wang from the Anti-Corruption Endowment. Um, in October 2019, Mr. Wagenknecht launched legal action at the European Court of Justice after the European Council failed to respond to his concerns about the alleged conflict of interest of um, Mr. Babish. And I believe that last month you launched another case before the European Court of Justice. So I hope we will be able to, to discuss both of those cases in greater detail. But, but for now, um, why don't we turn it over to our first speaker, Ms. Laura okodritsa uh, If we can hear you, just to make sure that the system is working. Hello? This is fucked. Everything is fucked. Okay, uh, we can hear you. We can hear you. Great. So just by way of introduction, um, can you maybe uh, unplug it and I cannot hear them. So well, maybe then we just wait a few. Um, because we can hear you, but I think they don't hear us. So maybe um, while we while we wait, um, I will introduce Ms. Kovishi, who is the first European public prosecutor and the former chief prosecutor of Romania's National Anti-Corruption Directorate, uh, a position she held from 2013 until she was actually fired on the order of the former justice minister, Tudor Al in July 2018. I think it was one of the first stories that I wrote about Romania when I started this job. And in 2016, Ms. Kivishi was the first woman and the youngest prosecutor general in Romania's history. And she's also the only public servant to have held the office of prosecutor general for the entire duration of its term. Um, and she was recently appointed European public prosecutor. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how she is setting up her, her office and her team. But perhaps um, we are still waiting for the, for the audio to work. So perhaps um, we can go back to Dan. Here we are. Is it working? Hello. Hello. Hi, Ms. Kuveshi. Hello. How are you? Hello, can you hear us? I cannot hear you. I just can't see you. Oh dear. Mm. Oh dear. So while, while you keep working on the technical um, uh, difficulties, I want to also remind the audience that uh, we are collecting questions in the Q&A uh, feature on the Zoom, and we've already gotten some fantastic questions that I'm looking forward to asking. Um, but until then, um, I wanted to ask actually Daniel maybe to come back and, and give us a little, a few of the juicy details. What kind of projects did you see? Um, how, how much money are we talking here while you were in Hungary? And um, uh, what, yeah, what, what were you most concerned about in terms of some of the specifics of, of what you saw? So what, what I went to see mostly um, outside of Budapest was, is I, I, I went to Orban's birth village uh, because that's where uh, there, there's a whole collection of, of vanity projects now. So Orban has a house uh, still in this village. And basically, I mean, it's so bizarre when you're there, there's this, this house and right next to the house, he built a stadium that fits twice the amount of people that actually live in this village. So you have a huge stadium in, in the middle of nowhere, in a way. Uh, next to that stadium, he built a tiny uh, railroad uh, that has only three stops. It runs for about six minutes. So I was fortunate enough to, to get there uh, for the one day, uh, once a day trip that this <laughs> train actually makes. So I rode it uh, till the end. It stops in the middle of nowhere in a, in a cornfield. Uh, and then you ride it back. When they wrote the initial application for this project, EU-funded uh, transport project, right? They, they wrote that 2,000 people uh, would be using this train every single day. Um, obviously, there, there never is anyone. I think the only people ever riding this train are uh, crazy politicians like myself uh, and a couple of TV crews uh, that have gone uh, to film this. I don't think there, there ever is anyone else that rides this train. He has now built a fish pond next to, to one of the train station stops, again with EU money, this time environmental funding. It's, it's, it's bizarre to see the kind of things uh, that they do with these vanity projects. But I think maybe more importantly, uh, what I learned on the ground is that they systematically rig uh, the, the tenders that they do. So whenever there's EU funding, let's say to build new kindergartens, to build schools, to build 
infrastructure like bridges or, or roads or whatever, systematically they, they trick these tenders. They enter fake firms to pretend that there is competition. Uh, they have pre-selected already which, which company will, will win the project and they get a cut from that. So, I mean, no one can really tell how much money they're, they're stealing, but how systematic this is in each part of the country, how they control the process and no one that is not part of the Fidesz circle can win any of these tenders. It seems that they're taking 20, 30, maybe 40% of all the EU funding that, that is going into the country. And when, when you see sort of how basically his school friends, his uh, student life colleagues uh, that, that are winning these projects and they're giving a cut to his direct family, uh, Orban's dad runs the most profitable quarry in the European Union, if not in the world, with a profit margin of 40%. Uh, he is furnished, he is delivering all the, the stones. His son-in-law uh, is, is winning tenders, for example, on street lighting and so on. Um, no, no competition and, and they win those projects and to see that on the ground, how systematic that is and how unable we as the European Union are to do anything about it, how we're getting played uh, on this was, was really quite shocking. And, and what are the prospects, do you think, for the real ability to, to tie uh, rule of law benchmarks to EU funds? But let's, we, I, want, I think we should all discuss this, but I just want to check, Ms. Ms. Kuvishchi, can you hear us yet? Um, can you turn on your microphone, actually? Um, if you're, or are you talking to us? No, you can hear me? Yes, can yes! Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry for, for these technical issues to connect, but uh, well, in the end, uh, I am in. <laughs> it's okay. You, you made it. It's great. I think a lot of people are looking forward to hearing from you. I, I don't know if you heard me. Um, I've already introduced you as the first uh, European public prosecutor and the first woman to serve as prosecutor general and the only person, the only public servant to serve the entire duration of your term. And I think we are really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about um, the new body that you're heading. Um, and I, I was um, able to catch some of your interview last night with Euronews where you were discussing a bit that the EPPO is under-resourced. I mean, what is it that, that you need the most? And, and do you worry that funding is going to be threatened now um, in the aftermath of the global pandemic? Okay, uh, thank you mo uh, very much for the um, invitation. I did not hear what the other panelists said already, but uh, I will try to, to answer to, her, to your question. Uh, but maybe before it's uh, very important to say a general things about uh, what is in my view very important to have when uh, we want to fight with corruption and especially when we want to fight with uh, the criminality related to the fraud with um, European funds. In my view it's very important to uh, have some conditions. First of all, it's important to have a specialized structure in combating corruption and funds with European funds. The most important condition is the independence of prosecutor, the independence of judiciary. And this is a main principle for the rule of law. Also, we need to have appropriate legislative tools to give the prosecutors, to give the law enforcement instruments to fight with this criminality. And also, it's important to have enough resources, human and financial one. If we have all these conditions, we can start to fight efficiently against corruption and against the fraud with the EU funds. But when we speak about the European Public Prosecutor Office, it's important to say the EPPO was not, is not a body uh, that we will fight only against corruption. EPPO will investigate fraud involving EU funds of over 10,000 euros and cross-border VAT fraud cases involving damages of above 10 million euros. So corruption related to the use of European funds or tax fraud represents also an important category of the cases within the competence of the EPPO. And uh, 
why will the EPPO be a game changer in the fight against fraud with European funds? Well, until now, there were differences between the member states. In some member states, there had been thousands of investigations, while in other member states, there were two or no case or less cases in each year. From now on, to investigate and prosecute these crimes will be a priority for all the European delegated prosecutors. And in this way, we will increase the level of protection for European funds. There will be 22 European prosecutors at central level in Luxembourg, one per participating member states. And these 22 European prosecutors will supervise investigations, which will be performed by the European delegated prosecutors in each participating member state. The EPPO will be prosecuting in front of the national courts. And what is very important for the EPPO is the fact that EPPO will be independent from national governments, commission, other European institutions, bodies and agency. And this is very important because as I said, the independence of the prosecutor office is the first premise to obtain efficient results in fighting corruption and other serious crime. Uh, well, why uh, it's EPPO, it's something new because uh, we have a lot of possibility to obtain an aggregate information at European level, to conduct investigations without being limited by national borders, uh, to generalize the use of the most efficient investigative tactics and to conduct investigations sim simultaneously in different member states. Indeed, not all the member states participate to the EPPO at this stage. We are missing Hungary, Poland, Denmark, Ireland and Sweden. What this means, I will give you an example. If a Hungarian citizen uses a false document in Hungary to obtain European funds, or if an Irish company uses European funds in Ireland for other purposes than those for which they were granted, the EPPO cannot investigate this crime. We can investigate only those cases in which citizens from non-participating member states are involved if they committed the crimes on a territory of a participating member state or using a company that has its headquarter in a participating member state, or if they have some connection in a participating member state. So uh, this is uh, why it's missing now for EPPO, but it's important to say that EPPO will uh, investigate the cases in 22 member states, and this is uh, important. Also, I should state as a general issue that um, especially in this period, we already saw the proposal to have more budget, but in the meantime, we'll be, it will be more flexibility and this means more risks to commit the, the fraud with uh, European funds. EPPO is the not only is not only one the solution to solve this um, issue. We also need to prevent this uh, uh, kind of criminality and to work together with the other institutions and body of the European institution of the European Union and to try to prevent a little bit this type of uh, criminality. I'm sure that there are a lot of questions. I will be glad to, to answer to all of them. Wow, that's great to hear. That's great to hear that you will be willing to answer them all. Thank you so much, Ms. Kivashi, for your for your opening remarks. I wonder if we can now pivot to a discussion about the the prospects for the proposals to link the EU budget funding uh, for the next budget to rule of law performance, and also this idea of having an all country rule of law review. I mean, do we think that this will really help improve the governance and disarm the double standards argument used by some countries that have been criticized? Uh, heavily, like Hungary, Poland, R Romania. Daniel, maybe we can start with you. Well, I, well uh, sorry. Well, uh, if you want to go first, uh, go, go. No, first. no, no, sorry. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, the prospect of ha having a functioning 
monitoring of the rule of law situation in, in all member states and, and then ideally linking that monitoring to, to possible financial sanctions. If, if we had that in place, I, I think that would be a, a, a strong and important signal. How good are the prospects at the moment of, of getting that? Um, it's a bit difficult to tell because they, the, the devil lies in the detail, right? Um, all member states by now have basically said that something called a rule of law mechanism should exist. So, so this far we, we agree. And any, any uh, decision on this has to involve every single member state. It, it will be a una unanimous vote on the next seven year budget, right? So if even one member state says, no, this, this is not happening. Um, and, and obviously we all know that, that some of these countries very well know that if you get too strong a rule of law mechanism, uh, they, they risk, right? Uh, Babish uh, sees this, Orban see, sees this. So, so they don't want something that is too strong. So the whole trick is linking it to, to, to the funds. And there the question basically now with Corona is that um, it has become so urgent to disperse funds to those countries where the economies have been hit most severely through the economic fallout of the Corona crisis, Italy, Spain, France, um, but, but it, to a certain extent, almost every single member state uh, is, is seeing their economy collapse at the moment. So the question will be at the end, how long uh, will everyone be willing to hold out and sort of push the, the reluctant governments into accepting a rule of law mechanism all the while not receiving any of this funding? Or will they ultimately say, well, we're seeing uh, that basically uh, Euroscepticism in Italy has jumped 20% in the, in the matter of days. Uh, we're, we're risking losing uh, large member states uh, for, for the EU. And what's a couple of billion lost uh, in, 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 in Czech Republic or in Hungary against uh, you know, the possible disintegration of the entire union if we don't put a rescue package together. So I think that's a bit where the crux of the debate is. Uh, for, for me, obviously, uh, you know, saying we need to get this money out the door quickly to save the economy is, is a bit of a, a, a false objective when you know, getting that money out of the door, but only into the pockets of, of kleptocrats or you know, not actually reaching the people that, that need this money um, to, to rebuild the economy, then, then we're not helping anyone. So I, I hope that there can be an agreement on this, but I also know that it's really not a given right now in the council. Thank you. I wonder, Lucas, what do you think about this topic? I mean, do you, how feasible is it and, and how worried are you about uh, extra corruption with regard to the risks with regard to the recovery fund? Just make sure you unmute yourself. Yeah, okay, okay. So can you again? So I have to completely agree with Daniele because it's clear it's easy, but from our perspective, it's very difficult because if we have prime minister, which has future conflict of interest, and he has the power on the, as I mentioned, all the national bodies, it's, how to say, it's not possible to implement the rule of law in his own case. Yeah. What does it mean if he would like to make some new adoption of the European directives and others, which are linked, in, linked to this things, for example, like to his conflict of interest in the area of media, in the area of public tendering procedures, uh, EU money spendings, how it is possible? Because he is the only one who has the power on that, finally. And it is impossible. So I think I would like to ask for help, Mr. Kovese, because for now, if we would like to make some final result from the Czech National Court, for now, it is, it is impossible. We do not, do not have still. So I think that case of Orban, Babish, and others will be the cases for Mrs. Kovese, because if the prime minister have the power, is quite a different kind of the people. He is above the law. How, how he would like to make some changes from him, it is not possible. So I think in this case, I'm very glad that we have new EPPO for such a kind of cases. And I think I will communicate with Mrs. Kovesi later then because we can't implement these rules for all the people except Babish because he don't want to do that yet. So I think it is not only problem of the Czech Republic, also Hungary, Poland, other others. And uh, this is high, highest level of corruption, state capture. If you have the power on business, 
on subsidies, but also on the state, on media and others. If we are populists, like Babish and Orban, it is impossible to make any changes here from the Prague. We need to help, I think. Yeah, so I hope that Mrs. Kovese also will deal, deal with this, because if you know that these two cases, Hungary and Czech Republic, for now have very big trouble with that. The biggest problem is that such a huge amount of the money, which is coming from the Europe, European Union to Babish's companies, what is the final result? His companies are bigger and bigger and more powerful. He has more and more money, which can he use for political issues. It means, finally, indirectly, European Commission, he support such a kind of populist politician here in East and uh, Middle Europe. And it's very depressive for me. So I think also it is on the side of European Commission and other European bodies to deal with that. One thing is framework. It's great, it's okay. But second things is to make some action steps. If the European Union will still pay oligarchs and uh, populists in Eastern Europe, what, what, what will happen? These people, they will be okay with European Union, Union until they will earn the money. But after a couple of years, the balance will change. What will happen? We will fight with the European Union because we have to have some devil, some bad guy who makes the problems. And easiest way is to find and show to the European Union. So I think the first thing is the framework. The second thing is the rule of the law. But how can be independent the whole system, which is under Prime Minister here in Prague? It is not possible. And, second, and the third thing is actions of European Commission. And I think they, until now, they still do nothing which has real impact. So I think European Parliament also, you are very good, you make some pressure, but it's not enough. We have to follow this and the changes. Yeah. So it's my point of view. And I will be very happy that Mr. Kovacic will start his business and we will do also with her. So. Thank you so much. I would like to ask Ms. Kivashi uh, the same question. Do, do you, th I mean, how concerned or how, how do you feel about proposals to link the EU budget funding to rule of law performance? And do you think that having an all country rule of law review would disarm uh, some of these arguments about double standards that, that we see, especially in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, and also, how worried are you about the prospect, uh, as Daniel said, mentioned, of um, putting the recovery funding through very quickly and, and how vigilant will you be about the funds that are, are being dispersed for, for the recovery? Okay, so I will try to comment and to give you an answer, but it will be very difficult for me because I'm a prosecutor, I'm not a politician. So I can give you only an answer as a prosecutor. Um, for prosecutors in general, it's good when you have an instrument to check how the money are uh, used. But our job is uh, to investigate the criminality, to investigate the crimes. And EPPO will investigate all the crimes that are uh, under uh, our jurisdiction. This means the fraud with the uh, European funds. But we will investigate only those cases that were committed after 2017 because uh, only from that moment we will have jurisdiction to investigate. So we will protect the rule of law making these investigations. But uh, as I said in uh, the general remark, it will be very independent, it will, it will be very important the independence of prosecutors. Uh, based on the regulation, on uh, EPPO regulation, EPPO will be an independent body, but the core of EPPO will be the prosecutors, the Euro European delegated prosecutors, and they will work in all those 22 member states. To obtain results and to investigate important cases, because the main goal of EPPO will not be to investigate pity corruption or pity cases, our main role will be to investigate cross-border crimes uh, and the, 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 the crimes that are uh, really have an impact in society. And for that, we need to have good prosecutors, independent prosecutors, courageous prosecutors, 
and to be sure that through our work, we all the time, we will prove that the law is equal for everybody. I'm sure that EPPO will investigate people who has uh, an important role in the society uh, or uh, people who, has, uh, who are reached, businessmen, politicians, of course. But um, for this, it will be very important to be sure that EPPO is an independent body. Uh, when we speak about this mechanism, it's very difficult for me to, to comment. It's a political decision. But uh, what I can comment is the fact that we will investigate all the important cases. We will investigate all the cases that uh, falls under our jurisdiction. But it's also important to say that we have a mandatory jurisdiction. So all the cases, that, all the crimes that are committed, we have to investigate them even if the crime is committed by a person who has uh, uh, who is in an important position or not. Thank you so much. Um, but b before I keep abusing my position as moderator to ask all of my questions, I do want to remind people that, uh, that you can submit questions via the Q&A and I'm going to start answering that, um, start asking a few of them, but I just wanted to do one follow-up with, with Ms. Kivashi a, a bit more about uh, specific things that you, that you still need for the most efficient work of your office. I, you discussed this a little bit last night, but can you give some, some tangible examples about what kind of support and staffing you still need, uh, what kind of uh, rules and procedures still need to be put in place in order for the office to be fully functioning? Well, we have some obstacles when we speak to the, about the setting up the EPPO. First of all, it's uh, the appointment of the European prosecutors. And uh, uh, because Malta did not propose enough eligible candidates, the whole process was put on hold. So we should have the European prosecutors appointed in December, but they are still not appointed. What this means? This means that if we don't have the European prosecutors, we cannot have the college. And if we don't have the college, we can approve the internal rules and the, uh, the other uh, uh, legal framework, internal legal framework for, uh, for EPPO. And uh, the second issue is the appointment of the European delegated prosecutors. They should be recru selected, recruitment, and after the appointment, they should be trained. Of course, a third issue, a third obstacle that we have, it's the, that still we do not have enough budget. And when I said budget, I refer to enough position at the, the central level, and we do not have enough budget for the operational uh, issues. But we are still negotiating, and uh, based on the proposal that the European Commission made, uh, I'm, I, uh, hope that uh, with the help of the European Parliament and with the ministers, we will uh, have, we will increase the budget for the EPPO because it's very important to have enough resources to start. Another issue is related to the next multi-annual financial framework because we, as an institution, we have to grow and uh, we have to, to receive enough uh, budget for uh, making the investigation. In the beginning of EPPO, I estimated that we will receive at least 3,000 cases. This is a huge amount of the, the cases and we have to have enough uh, resources to deal with. Maybe I can jump in there uh, for, for a second. Yes, please. Just, just to maybe illustrate how, how bizarre this situation is, right? We're negotiating a, a 750 billion euro recovery fund. We are uh, discussing, despite this still being too small, uh, we, we are discussing the, the, the largest EU budget um, that, that we've had. And still we're, we're not sufficiently increasing all the, the budget of those institutions that are supposed to check uh, that, that this budget is, is properly spent, that there's no fraud, misuse, um, and, and, and so on. And 
Yeah, Ms. Kervisi mentioned that she, she expects 3,000 cases when, when the office starts fully working on the 1st of November. When the commission initially planned how many cases there, there would be, uh, the, the plan was made for 800 cases, 829 I think was the exact number um, per, per year. So, so there's underfunding of a factor three to four of, of, of the institution. And I mean, another example of that, um, and, and I'm sure there's questions sort of how come that the EU is not actually checking the funding uh, that, that is flowing to, to friends and family of prime ministers in the Czech Republic or in, 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 in Hungary. If you look concretely, I mean, at, at any given point in time, there's about 70,000 projects that are funded in Hungary, for example. Um, but if you look at how many resources we're dedicating um, in, in the anti-corruption body of the EU, OLAF, there, there is five or six people working on projects in Hungary. So five or six people are, are supposedly checking on 70,000 uh, projects and making sure that no money is being stolen there. So, so that obviously is a complete mismatch. But then on, on those cases where they actually manage to, to find something, well, we as the EU so far, and in, in Hungary, it will remain the case since, as, as Lara Krivizi said, she, she isn't allowed to intervene in Hungary because they refuse to join. So, so what happens if they do actually find something? Well, they can't go uh, and, and, you know, investigate themselves, arrest people, confiscate documents and, and run a court case uh, and put people in, in prison or something. No, they hand over those files with their findings to the Hungarian prosecutor, who is then supposed to do that. But the Hungarian prosecutor is, is an Orban guy. It's, it's someone from Fidesz that Orban has put into this position. So basically all those cases that Olaf comes with and, and brings them to Hungary, they, they go nowhere. They, they land in the shredder of, of, uh, of, a, of a Fidesz guy and nothing ever, no, nothing ever happens on that. So, so that's kind of where we're stuck at the moment where the whole system is built on member states functioning on member states, prosecutors, police, court system, properly functioning. And when that is no longer the case, we basically, at, at the moment, we can't do anything about it. Thank you. Well, um, the, 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 the EPPO, sorry, the EPPO will bring a change in this because uh, the prosecutors, the European delegated prosecutors, they'll, will work in each member state will be the prosecutors of EPPO. They will be independent by the national authorities. But for this, it's important to have only full-time prosecutors because the, based on the regulation, there is a possibility to have only part-time prosecution. But I insisted and uh, I, I believe very much that uh, we cannot start with uh, part-time prosecutors. They have to work only for EPPO. This is the best way for their independence, efficiency, or also for their responsibility. They should not be double headed to have also a national prosecutor as a chief and also to work for, for EPPO. And uh, I hope this will be the main difference uh, when we speak about the European delegated prosecutors, that they will work for EPPO and we can bring a change in the way how they will investigate this criminality. And also there are some discrepancies between the member states. You know, there are some member states and the prosecutors investigated hundreds of cases in each year, but there are some clean states, let's say that, and the prosecutors investigated only two or eight cases per year. This is a huge discrepancy because they did not have the same priorities. They, did, they were not focused on this type of criminality and EPPO will change that. Thank you, Ms. Kivashi. Um, I have a question for, it's directed to everyone, but I might ask Mr. Vaganex. Um, it's from Dan Kellerman, who, said, who asks why the commission is not using its existing authority under the Common Provisions Regulation, which regulates structural funds, to suspend funds to states that lack the adequate oversight mechanisms, such as independent courts, to control corruption. The commission did something similar with the Czech Republic in 2012, but refuses now. And, and Mr. Kellerman asks, isn't there a risk that debating new rule of law conditionality and new annual reports just gives the Commission an excuse not to use the authority that it already exists. 
Oh, nice question, but probably a question on European Commission. Yeah. That's the case because I deal with European court in Luxembourg, uh, because I don't understand that. Yeah, because I think there is easy possible way how to interrupt um, payments to Babish. But until now, there is no final conclusion the European Commission, and we do not understand that. Yeah, because it's also very funny, it's not as sad, but as you know, we have some findings in EU audit, European Commission audit, about the uh, conflict of interest of Babish on one side. And on the other hand, we know that agricultural subsidies, they are still flowing. It means Babish still, his company still, uh, still earns hundreds of millions of Czech crowns. How is this possible? Yeah. So there's a question to Mr. von Leyen. I am asking her for last two years, or not only her, but other, uh, her colleagues. And I don't understand that. And I think that's the case that we have the conflict, not only, as I mentioned, not only national level, but also on the European level. Because if Babish is a member of the European Council, they have to deal about laws and other things. Yeah. So I, I don't understand that, why they don't use the, the procedure. There is normal standard procedure. Interruption of EU funds directly to uh, structural funds, agricultural funds. But I'm not sure they, they still use it until now. And I don't understand it. And only one thing I think about is possible that there is how to say some not standard way to deal with issue because it's rubbish. And it's terrible for me if we would like to have the rule of law on national level. And if we can say how it's possible that in, on a European level, on the European Commission level, they ignore the law, how they would like from us to follow the rules here in Prague if they don't follow their rules. So very good question, not question on me, but maybe for Mr. von Leyen and her colleagues, and also maybe for Daniel, because I think that European Parliament fighted this. Yeah. But the problem is that the power of European Commission is very, how to say, they have very big power on that. But if I, I as a senator from the Prague, I would like to see what, what, what they will do, because also I have the power to control uh, national budget for EU funds. It's my responsibility here in Prague. But if I do not have any feedback, for example, if I'm asking to Mr. von Leyen, please send me some um, notice from your meeting with Babish, I would like to know what you discussed about. No response. So they ignore not only me, but all the citizens here in Prague. And I think it's a very bad example for us because if we can see that they make such a kind of way of implementation of EU money spending. I think it is a breaching of the European law and rule. I think it is corruption. Correctly it is because they should exclude conflict of interest and they support it. So I think it is case for Mr. Kovese because who else should deal with that? Yeah. And it's very sad for me because if we, uh, we, we can see this kind of example, so what will happen in next period? I think it should be worst. So we will we will see what will happen. But good question, question from for to Mr. von Leyen, and we will see what will happen. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Freund. I want to ask you to respond also to that and to ask another question posed by Lucy Sikorova. Um, who says, with, within negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework, are there any other proposals about uh, different mechanisms for distributing EU, EU funds and EU subsidies, um, or only about the possible suspension? Thanks. So, uh, I mean, I, I have discussed the, the, the question with Mr. Kellerman uh, repeatedly, and we've asked the question to the commission. I, I see it exactly the same way uh, for, for me. The monitoring and control systems in, in these countries um, no, no longer function and probably haven't functioned for, for, for years. Um, so the EU, the Commission, has the capacity to suspend those funds. But so far they say um, they, they don't see the conditions fulfilled. Uh, they think that the monitoring system, and the management system of the member states still somehow works. Um, and I guess ultimately they're afraid that if they would actually suspend those funds, um, member states would take it to court. If they would lose those cases, uh, they would sort of lose the last 
tool in a way that they have to to check on member states. But I, I think, I mean, given how dire the, the situation, at least in a couple of member states, has gotten, uh, it's a, it's about time to um, to to find out and and to 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 make the case. But they are very very hesitant, uh, let's say, to to put the pool, the tools at their disposal. And I, I fully understand the argument that adding additional tools to the toolbox when when you're not willing to to make use of them is 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 maybe not the most useful exercise and, and that we should do that so um what is currently discussed uh in 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 those budget negotiations on on the rule of law mechanism well the the most important question that is being discussed among the governments because so far i mean the commission made a proposal on this the european parliament already voted a rule of law sanctions mechanism in 2018. And since then, governments have refused to even open a negotiation with us and the parliament. So they have thrown this into the budget negotiations, uh, which shifted the question from a normal qualified majority question into unanimity, where each single member state can block this. And they linked it to, to the budget negotiations for the next seven years, right? And so the, the, the real question where it hinges on right now is, if there were such a sanctioning mechanism, if you could cut funding uh, to those member states that, that have generalized deficiencies of the rule of law, um, how would you trigger that? So the initial commission proposal was, the commission says, okay, in this member state, uh, there is such rule of law deficiencies, we want to cut the funding. And then you would need a qualified majority of member states objecting to that. So you would need, uh, 18 member states basically to say, no, we don't think so. Uh, we want to stop that mechanism here. That's quite a high bar. Uh, what happened in the council uh, in February is that Charles Michel, when he made his last proposal on the budget and we're expecting the, 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 the updated one uh, basically as we speak uh, this week probably. Um, but back then he said he wanted to turn this around. And if you wanted to launch a sanction against a member state, you would need the 18 member state uh, qualified majority saying we, we want to sanction this member state. And we have seen in the past on any, on any sanction, uh, for example, on the, um, on the stability and growth pact where member states are not allowed uh, to go into too much debt, to run too high deficits, you never manage to get a qualified majority of member states to, to basically go against another member state because that costs you political capital. Member states don't have the tendency to go against each other. Um, so, so that would basically render this rule of law mechanism useless in a, in a way. So that's really the, the question where it is. Um, the other thing then when it comes to sanctioning, so the, the, the idea is so far just cut all the funding. What we have said as Greens is we don't just want to simply cut all the funding. We want to make sure that the money still goes to those that it should actually reach, right? The, uh, the poor school somewhere in, 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 uh, in, in rural Poland or something that needs renovation, uh, they should still get that money. Um, so, so we want to find new ways to basically cut out the middleman, to no longer allow Babish or Orban to distribute this money how they see fit but to do direct distribution or to give more money to let's say cities or to NGOs or well distribute the money directly from the EU rather than through national governments. Thank you so much. We have actually a lot of uh, procedural questions coming in from Ms. Kuvishi. Um, and I will ask you one from, from Bea Bako, who's a journalist at Azonali Pontu, it's a Hungarian uh, news portal, um, who asks, you say that you could investigate against a, a Hungarian individual only if they commit a fraud or corruption in, inside of an EPPO member country. And you also said that, the, but you also said that the EPPO prosecutors will raise charges before national courts. Um, in the eventual case of a Hungarian accused person, what court would lead the process? Would it be a Hungarian court, or in the effect, or would it be the prosecutor in the affected EPPO member country? And in the latter case, do you see a European arrest warrant being fulfilled without any problems? Well. Based on the regulation, usually the cases will be sent to the national courts. But when we speak about cross-border uh, crimes, 
on the, in those cases where are involved people from different member states, it's important to say who will make the investigation. And for example, if we have a case in a participating member state and a Hungarian or Irish or Sweden person is involved, the case will be investigated in that uh, participating member state and the indictment, if it will be an indictment, will be sent in that course, in that participating member state, not in Hungary. So it's very difficult to give a direct answer because we can have in a case uh, a Hungarian person and also let's say a Romanian one, a Bulgarian one or a Slovenian one. But it's important where the main acts of the crime were committed and who will be the European delegated prosecutor who will investigate its case. So we can have situations where a Hungarian person can be indicted in Slovakia, in Austria, or in another participating member state. It's not necessary to the, for the prosecutor to send all the time the cases in front of the national court. Thanks. And, and another procedural question for you actually comes from Steve Martin, who wants to know, um, considering that you mentioned that there's a shortage of human resources, will the EPPO be making use of newer data technology like um, AI or machine learning um, to detect potential and, and more important cases of criminality? Are you using some kind of new newfangled softwares to, to help you flag cases? Well, we would like to use the new technology, but we will use the same technology that all the prosecutors in the Europe uh, still have. And uh, it's important to say that uh, we need uh, enough resources to do that. For, for the beginning, uh, based on what we have until now, it's very difficult to say that we will use very sophisticated machine and things like that to do our job. No, if I uh, should make a comparison, it's like uh, when we, when I started as a chief of EPPO, I had a car with one wheel without engine. And now based on the proposal that the commission made, they uh, uh, proposed to triple, to almost triple the budget. So in this moment we have three wheels, one engine, but can we drive the car? Well, it's, obvious that we cannot drive. Just, just starting EPPO, we need uh, more, uh, more budget and we ask only for the main issues that uh, the prosecutors are using in their activity. So let's uh, be very clear, we will not have robots and very sophisticated machine in, in EPPO, but it's important that we will have 140 European delegated prosecutors, and I hope they will be the best prosecutors in each member state. And with them, we have enough experience and we have enough knowledge to try to investigate. And um, well, Based on this question, maybe I, I will explain a little bit that uh, to detect the crimes, it's not the job of the prosecutors. The prosecutors should make the investigation. So there are a lot of institutions at the national level, at the European level, who can detect the crimes. And when uh, I'm thinking to, to those institutions, the main partner can be Olaf, because they have enough resources and they can focus more than EPPO to detect the crime, to inform EPPO about those crimes and let EPPO to investigate those cases. Thank you, thanks. I have, a, we'll pivot a bit um, to, to the question of, of uh, funds and media. Uh, Mr. Wagenknecht, we have a question from Johanna Hovarka who is from Forum 24. And uh, she asks, in the Czech Republic, there is not just a problem with misuse of funds by Mr. Babish, but the fact that he is the owner of a lot of media outlets. How do you see that the EU can react on this issue? It, this is also part of a conflict of issues, a conflict of interest, excuse me, but also, as she says, a very big problem for the democracy. Yeah, also a very difficult question because we adopted a conflict of interest law which aim also to the media. 
Yeah, but as we can see, Babi still ignored that. And he's owner of one of, one of the biggest media house. It means he has print. It means, for example, if you are traveled by national Czech railways, mostly you will, they will give you his magazines and newspapers. If you are going into the underground, into the metro, there is free of charge distributed his magazine, Metro and other. So this influence is very, very high and very destructive to the democracy. But what I, what I can say about the legislation, I, I'm not sure that there is some uh, systematic framework on a European level in the field of uh, conflict of interest of media. It means it's on the national side, unfortunately. And we have to deal deal with that. Uh, our problem is also that that Babish, he also for now he has the his own private media, which he can use for political competition. So it means he earns a huge amount of the money from European Union. He bought media house. He also last year he also bought a very big lifestyle media house. It means if you are going into the shop you can see only Babish is all third of all of everything is Babish only in print and the problem for us for now is also his power on the public media because we have public media well, but for now there probably there will come some changes in that in that field it means that uh, Babish and his um, members of the parliament uh, with current government they can make some changes personal changes in the committees of public media and if he will get also the power on public media and together this is private sector media it will be this destruction of the whole democracy fourth pillar of the democracy here in czech republic i think we are three step um, before hungary i think in hungary it is a very big problem because urban as i know from my friends from Budapest that he has the power on the private and also public sector in the media and it will be very bad for us. So it's very difficult, but as I know, what, what I know about that, there is no central regulation in that field on the European level. Maybe we should start to deal with this, also colleagues in the European Parliament should start with this because it's not normal in Germany, it's not normal in Netherlands and other countries. But for now, it's normal standard in Eastern Europe. It means in Hungary, for now, it should come also to Prague. So it's a very big problem and it will be very difficult because it's our business, it's the Czech side problem, but there is no regulation. So it will be very, very hard fight with that. And we will see what will happen after one year. So I don't have some clear answer on that questionnaire, but on the other hand, it's our fight. We start to deal with that. We have to use some uh, watchdogs, some international organization which support that. But it will come and it will be more harder yeah, for us. Thank you, Mr. If, 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 if I may, on, on that media question, um, because that was one of the most shocking things that, that I heard in, in, in Hungary is that basically on on the public television channel uh, for the last four years, um, no opposition party leader or, or leading politician has gotten sort of live airtime. They are not invited to talk shows, they are not interviewed, they, they don't get to speak basically. Um, so, so the only way that the opposition politicians are reported on is in reports that, that say how incompetent, how useless uh, they are, or how they're trying to bring terrorist migrants into the country. So basically they don't appear in the state media and the, the, the private other media sources have all been taken over uh, by Orban, um, including, for example, Deutsche Telekom was running an independent news site uh, very successfully in the, in, in the country, great political reporting. Uh, and the Orban government basically coerced them into selling that to to him. Uh, he concentrated all this media in a uh, in a fund uh, that that he controls. So a 
a, a, com a German company that were uh, a minority blocking minority stake is held by the German government. They basically threw one of the last remaining independent media sources under the bus uh, in, in Hungary to continue winning large uh, telecoms infrastructure projects in the, in the country. And now the only independent media source that's left is a website called Index. And that is currently being uh, destroyed. I met some of the, their people last week. Um, so uh, they, as, as many media, I imagine, during the, the corona crisis are, are getting into funding issues. Uh, but basically, that's the chance immediately used by, by Fidesz, by the government controlled fund, um, to, to basically, in a way, stop the last uh, remaining independent media. And for years already, we've had a situation where if you're a Hungarian living outside of Budapest, radio, television, newspaper, you cannot get independent, uh, non Orban, non Fidesz controlled media unless you go basically on the internet and read in English or German or French, uh, you read the BBC or Deutsche Welle or something, you're, you're not getting any, any independent media. And obviously that's, that's a huge issue. And as I said, I mean, one, one thing could be for the EU to give more funding, more protection, uh, for, for independent journalists, but maybe even more so, maybe we have to think about, you know, creating public, uh, public media, European uh, public media that can, um, that can provide in the independent reporting um, ac across the, the EU, but it would have to be in the, in the language of, 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 of those countries because uh, other, otherwise you, you don't reach the, the, the entire population. As I can make some addition to this, uh, Daniel, the, the, the best thing you said it was that if there will be some special fund for indep independent media, it will be the only one way which should help us. Today I have some meeting with some lady from the media and she, she told me we have very big problem with financing because we are small, we don't have the money because on the Czech side there will be nothing. And it is the biggest fight for them for now under Corona also. So I think if European Union will focus on that and the European Parliament, and they will, will find some more money for independent small and media houses, it will be very helpful for all the countries here. It means for Czech Republic, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, all of them. It means it's only way for now, which should be used by European Union to provide specific subsidy for them from their, their work because Without the resources, they will not be independent. And also it's very difficult because we discuss some very big issue about some state company, about some corruption. And also she told me it's a very big problem because for now I'm independent. I am in small media house websites. It's okay, but for now I make a very nice projects. It's very, very, how to say, very hard to investigate that. But if I will quit from this media house and I would like to find some another place, it will be very difficult for me. Yeah, so because it's because some medias are under rubbish power, some are publicly controlled, it means the only one way is to find some money for these small media houses. The only one. I think it should be very helpful and it is the one way which should help. And because central regulation, I think it is impossible to implement some central regulation. It will not happen on the European level. Yeah. But this will help. So enough for me. Thank you so much. It's nice as a journalist to see so much support for, for independent media. And I do want to give a shout out to, there are some small uh, and very good, very dedicated other media houses. I mean, Index is, in, is definitely under threat in Hungary, um, but there are a number of, of small, smaller uh, places that are also struggling, but the, the amount of brave uh, and really diligent, good journalists in Hungary, I know some of you are out there listening. I want to give you a shout out. So I have one more question for, for Mr. Freund from Jörg Bautner, uh, who asks about the green proposal to bypass the national administration instead of cutting funding in case of the rule of law infringements. He says it sounds appealing, but wouldn't it mean that the commission has to build up additional administrative structures as a fund administrator? So how do you answer that one? Yeah, uh, that, absolutely. That, that would need uh, additional administration. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that, you know, I mean, the, the objective I don't think can be 
that all the funds going to the Czech Republic or to Hungary are now directly administered from, from Brussels by building up a, a large bureaucracy there. Uh, in, a, in a way, you know, it's a, it's a game, right? You, you start distributing more funds uh, centrally uh, to, to help, for example, independent journalists or, or NGOs on the ground. But in a way, the objective is to bring a country back into the respect of the rule of law, right? And, and to be able to give back uh, the management done at some point to, to the national administration. But the, the, the question is, you know, how, how big a stick do you, do you need? How big the threat of, in a way, withdrawing the funding or rerouting the funding has to be for, for, for that to be effective? And, and we don't really know. Uh, I mean, if you would say tomorrow, um, the, the national government in Hungary does no longer get funding and we start as best as we can uh, to, to, to distribute that directly uh, from, from, from Brussels. How quickly would the government in Hungary cave in and, and you know, retract from some of those measures that they have put in place in the last 10 years is, is, is in a way not super easy to, to, to predict, but that, that's the fight ultimately that, that has to be won to re-establish the fundamental freedoms, to re-establish the independence of the press, to re-establish the independence uh, of the courts uh, in, in those countries. And until that's done, um, yeah, to, to possibly build up some additional uh, administrative structures that can, can distribute those fundings. Not all of that has to be done directly through the EU. We have seen in the past, for example, Norway funds, at least for a time, has also um, used other ways where, where they worked with partners on the ground that could uh, distribute some of their funding. So, so there is some ways, but it will probably be difficult to do that uh, for, for everything and right away. Thank you. I'm conscious that we have only 10 more minutes. I'm sure we could talk about this topic for hours on end, and I'm sure all of us do in our respective bubbles and communities. Um, but we have a question from Ms. Kubishi from Matthew Caruana Galizia, who is asking, what are the plans for expanding the remit of the EPPO to cover cross-border corruption and money laundering as a, fallback, as a fallback when national prosecutors' offices are captured? Mr. Caruana Galizia is from Malta, which is a country you mentioned. Uh, maybe this, yeah. Sorry. Can I answer? Yes, please, please. Okay. So the prosecutors of EPPO will be not will be independent. This is the first premises. They will be not limited in their competencies how they are limited now. When we speak about cross-border crimes, I can say that what I saw based on my previous experience, the prosecutors usually are focused to investigate the crimes that are committed on their soil, on their national soil. And they do not have all the time the information from abroad. To obtain information from abroad, they have to deal with uh, some uh, uh, instruments for international cooperation. But EPPO will not have this limit. So we will share very easy information and we will investigate better than now the cross-border crimes. But we have to take into consideration also another specificity when we speak about cross-border crimes, because uh, especially when we speak about corruption, you know, I heard this in, in, my, in the country that I, uh, I know the best. For example, a mayor, he's the most corrupt mayor in Romania. Huh? This is the fact. But for us as prosecutors, we cannot speak based on facts. We need proofs. So we have to start from somewhere. And uh, in this moment, we have difficulties because this kind of criminality, a special organized crime, cross-border crimes, they are a little confidential crimes and we need to have information and we need to obtain proofs and we need to have instruments to convince the people that we can protect them. But uh, based on what EPPO will be, we will have this advantage to investigate better the cross-border crimes. Okay. So we have a few more minutes. Um, do, I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything about that, but uh, we have, we've had actually one um, 
very persistent questioner asking this question in several different ways. And maybe we can pose it to Daniel and Lucas actually, um, who asks if it's possible to reduce the power and influence of large companies which want to maintain good relations with these self-service leaders and at the same time to put pressure on European politicians. I think, you know, in our discussions, we've discussed the way that uh, the, the tremendous access and power that, that large companies have. Uh, Daniel, you yourself mentioned Deutsche Telekom. Um, have have any of your interlocutors on the ground made made a I don't know suggestions about how feasible and some mechanisms to 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 really uh, decrease the power of these large companies and the and the influence that they have on, on at a national level? For instance, you know, in Hungary, if not a day passes by as a financial reporter in Hungary where uh, the influence of German companies on politics uh, and their role in supporting uh, the existing government is is not mentioned so yeah I mean it's 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 something that I think is is, is very much of the forefront of, um, of of what we think about these cases and, and what can we do I don't think that there's a, a single you know, silver bullet kind of measure that that solves the influence of, of money or large corporations on politics. But there's a number of things that we can do that I think would would help around these cases. The first thing that I would mention is to actually know that you're dealing with with the same entity. So so this is something that Lucas has has already uh, alluded to the um, the transparency of ownership structures, right? Because it's it's easy when when the name is on the box and you can see, okay, this is the large multinational. But uh, in in the case of of Prime Minister Babish uh, Agrofert, uh, there is at least 250 subsidiary companies. So even having an updated list of all the companies that actually do belong to the Prime Minister can be a, a challenge. And when you're the small uh, civil servant that is handing out government grants, you get a you get an application from a randomly named company. You know, I mean, you need to be able to see what is this company, who does it ultimately belong to, and does this possibly belong to the prime minister of my country? And that is not always possible at the moment. So these registers of beneficial ownership, uh, often in, in individual member states, already don't work. And they certainly don't work well once we start looking across borders, the criteria, the way that these databases work in one member state to the other, uh, complete chaos in a way. Uh, if, if only looking at the structure of companies that Mr. Babish owns, when you look at does Agrofert actually belong to Mr. Babish, uh, the transparency registers in Germany, in the UK, in Slovakia give completely opposing answers to, to that question. In some countries, Babish be, uh, owns these companies, in others it's unknown, no one is listed as the owner. So, so that's the first step, I think, uh, creating these functioning registers of who owns what. The second thing that I would mention, particularly when we're looking into agricultural funds, since this is such a large uh, share of the funding that we distribute, and most of this money is just distributed on how much land you own. And we have seen in many Eastern countries that basically the government has been selling off public land. Uh, there is very few people that, that buy up this land. They have tricked the system in a way that it's always the same people buying up this land. And just for owning this land, they get millions in, in EU funds. So one thing I think we should do as EU is cap the funding we pay out. Uh, we want to support small, uh, you know, sustainable farming in particular, but we don't want to fund structures that grow ever larger, uh, where basically billionaires start owning all the land in the EU and they bought this land with EU money. So I would say at a, at a certain size of a farm, you cap the funding and anyone that has a larger farm than that doesn't uh, receive any additional funding. I think those are, are maybe two tools that, that can help us in that direction, but there's, there's many additional things, of course, you can do to, to control the influence of, of large companies. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm trying to, Lucas, did you want to jump in there or should I, I just want to, there's so many questions that have been asked, but if oh, you want to say something, maybe we like can also go a few minutes over since, uh, since we started a bit late. So please go ahead. Okay, very briefly, uh, agree again with Daniel. I think transparency is the biggest, how to say, corrective measure for that. It means there are several levels. Uh, for the first, I think, for example, Czech Party Party, we have open register of lobbyists. It means if you will meet any 
guy from big business, it should be on, on a website, it should be visible for everyone because the transparency is the biggest, how to say, thing which will help you. The second thing uh, about the register of the beneficiary, beneficiary owners, I think it should be publicly available, uh, available now. But for example, in Czech Republic, it is not still. So I think also European Commission should help, help us because if the, several countries, not only Czech Republic, has open public register of beneficiary owners of the companies, we should fulfill this new regulation and also it will help us. And the second or the third thing also, I think the subsidies for big companies and farms, it has no sense. We will also part bigger, which will grow and they will destroy the market. It means this kind of support from European Commission for now destroys market for small, com small companies and medium. It's enough for me for this question. Thanks. Um, we had several questions from a Hungarian journalist, Katalin Halmai, and I want to ask, she asks Ms. Kuvashi, um, how do you see the chances of Sweden, Denmark, and Ireland actually joining the EPPO while only Hungary and Poland remain out? What, what, how would that affect your work? Well, this is a political decision, but uh, as a prosecutor, I hope that our colleagues from these non-participating member states will come in EPPO because we want to have them together with us. And our role is to make investigation, not to take political decision. We will continue to work with our colleagues from these non-participating member states using the the uh, instruments for cooper international cooperation that we used until uh, now. So, but I hope that in the future we will have this uh, colleague. Um, and in the end, I, I, I just want to ask if I have the right to put one question. Of course. Of course. I'm not sure if uh, uh, I just wanted to, to answer to the questions that you put from uh, Matthew Galizia. I'm not sure that if he is the son of Daphne Caruana Galizia. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. If he is uh, the son, I, I really want to use this opportunity to, to thank him for, for his support. Uh, last year when I candidated for this position and uh, I don't have enough words to, to tell him that I um, understand the tragedy that happens, but uh, I just want to promise him and to the other European citizens that I will do the best in my work and I will be an efficient, independent and strong uh, prosecutor office. And uh, this is the reason why I would like to work only with full-time prosecutors, because part-time prosecutors, as maybe some member states want, is not the solution to work efficiently. So thank you very much for this opportunity to, to put the, the question and to answer in the same time. Thank you. Uh, and we have a message from, from Matthew also saying thank you. Um, I wanted actually to, to ask one more question about potential future members, which is, you know, um, while you were the general prosecutor and then the head of the DNA in Romania, your country was actually seen as sort of a beacon for, for tackling organized crime and corruption. And I wonder if there's any discussion within the EPPO about expanding it actually to, to pre-accession member states. Of course, enlargement has, has been a bit slow, but um, many of the potential candidate countries receive quite a lot of, of uh, pre-accession funding. And I wonder if there's any discussion about a mechanism that, that you could use uh, to examine potential misuse of, of EU funds in, in aspiring member states. For instance, there was this example of um, Mr. Orban's son-in-law um, getting a big tender in Serbia, for instance. Well, we can open investigations based on any information that we can receive. So we will receive information from the national authorities, but also we can receive information from the citizens. It's not necessary to, to open investigation based on only from, on uh, uh, information that we will receive from the public institution. The citizen can send us information and also in my previous position we we follow the articles of journalists and 
time to time we open the investigation based on those articles. It's important for us to have the information. And after that, it's our job to transform that information, improves and to, 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 uh, to collect enough uh, evidence and to make an indictment. So, but uh, based on the regulation, we can investigate only those crimes that were committed after 2017. This is very important to, to say. We cannot investigate something that happens in 2015 or 2010. I'm not sure if uh, my answer, uh, it's related to your question. Maybe I did not understand very well the question, but if you need uh, more uh, explanation, please ask me. Uh, it's okay. I mean, I, I was, I always talk too fast and I, but I was wondering about the possibility for investigations in, in countries which are candidate, EU candidate mem countries, for instance, uh, Serbia or Montenegro, uh, and whether mm -hmm. you, you thought it would be possible or maybe a, a, a way to actually help these countries um, adhere to the EU rule of law guidelines. Well, the conditions to investigate this crime, this kind of crimes is the same with the non-participating member states. So if a citizen from this country and commit the crimes on the territory of participating member states, or there is a connection with participating member states, we can. Otherwise, it's very difficult. We cannot do that. Understood. Thank you so much. We've, we've gone a bit over time. I don't know if anybody else wants to make a sort of closing statement, but I know that uh, Mr. Freund has said that he's very willing to answer all of the constituents' questions by emails. Uh, by email, I, maybe I've now set you up and your, or your colleagues up for, for quite a lot of extra work, uh, but I appreciate that, that openness. Um, and I think we should really thank everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Baganek, Mr. Freund, and Ms. Kuvishi. Um, it's great that that you, we were able to, to get the technology sorted. And um, thank you to all of those of you, a lot of you who have stayed for this whole hour and a half discussion. I think it's very interesting and I hope this is only the beginning um, or the, some part of the beginning of the discussion uh, that we will continue to have over the next uh, months and years. So thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for asking me to participate. I learned a lot and I'm very grateful. Thanks for hosting, Valerie, and thanks to Thank everyone. You. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks.